What's up everybody and welcome back to another Addicted Fishing video. Today we're going tutorial style on the three best ways to catch spring salmon in any small river around. It's gonna be a lot of information today. Hopefully we get on some fish. Stay tuned, it's gonna be a good episode. So first and most obvious choice that we're gonna talk about today is fishing bobbers. Bait is sometimes, and, and I'd say pretty much always imperative when fishing for a spring salmon or any sort of salmon really. In my opinion, bait is pretty essential in any situation that you're gonna be fishing for salmon, especially in the springtime when you have high water, you have kind of dirty water like you see behind us, and you have nice fresh fish that are willing to eat bait and good water temperatures, which usually makes bait more effective to begin with. Usually if you have colder water, it's a safe bet that bait is gonna work better than any other sort of attraction that we're gonna talk about today. So that's why we're talking about it first. What we're gonna do here, I'm gonna show you guys exactly how to set up this bobber setup, exactly how to tie the egg loops, get everything ready, and we're gonna put some bait on and see if we can't catch a fish. So the rod I'm using here today is actually a rod that we use out in the Columbia and in the boats and everything. This is a 10-6 extra heavy, 15 to 30 pound rod. I like the 9.9 or the 10.6, either one of them work pretty good. And the extra heavy isn't imperative, but you can go with the medium heavy or you can go with the extra heavy. Both are good rods and both cast this three ounce bobber setup just fine. I'm using this in a bait caster setup. Even if you're scared to use a bait caster, fishing with a big bobber like we're gonna be using and fishing with a heavy lead, it's a lot easier to cast with a bait caster than you would normally think it is. So if you are gonna go out and invest in buying a new bobber rod, I would stay away from the spin cast and I'd, I'd go with a bait casting setup like we have here. The reel I have on here is a Citrix. This reel is a perfect size for this. It's got a big spool so I can fit a lot of line because I'm gonna be running these bobbers down through there. And I have a 50 pound braided line on here. And that braid is the Indicted Enforcer braid. It's a high vis orange, really easy to see out on the water. And it's very easy to mend because that 50 pound sits up on the surface of the water very well. And it makes it easy for me to correct my line as my bobber floats through the hole. So I'm not gonna add a bumper in this because we are gonna be fishing really deep holes a lot of the times with this setup. Depending on what river you're at or where you're fishing, a lot of the time the holes can be anywhere from eight to 30 feet deep. So in that 30 foot deep hole, I don't wanna be running a 30 foot bumper. It's gonna make it harder to cast. It's gonna be a pain in the butt. So I'm just gonna put bobber shops on my braided line. And what I've done here, you can see how that, bra that braid is a little bit darker. I've taken a Sharpie and I've run it across my line to kind of dole down that high vis line a little bit closer to where my bait's gonna be. So that's why that color is different. Now we're gonna add our rubber bobber stops. Now, because I'm gonna be using such heavy leads when I'm fishing this way, I'm actually gonna use two of these bobber stops. Put your line right through that little hole, grab the rubber part, and that'll slide up your line. Now that I have both of them on there, that ensures that that bobber shop's not gonna move when my stuff hits the water and sinks down with that two or three ounce lead that we're gonna be using. After that, I'm gonna add one more big bead, like, a, like an eight millimeter bead. That way I can see when my bobber's not working correctly or if anything's tangled up. After that, I'm gonna add my bobber onto my line. And I have a West Coast bobber here. There's a lot of different styles you can use out there. Bomac makes them. There's all kinds of different bobbers that are gonna work good for this adaption. But I like these ones because they're sturdy. You can overweight them quite a bit for when you're getting those sensitive bites and they're just a good long lasting bobber. So stick my braided line through there. This is the tr trickiest part. One of maybe the hardest things to do in the world is put wet braided line through a bobber. So if your line is wet, you can just tie a little half hitch with some monofilament line, stick it through and then pull the rest of the way through and then cut that monofilament line back off. Oh, damn it. Try number one. Aha, second time's the term. Now for your lead setup, there's two different styles that you can use. You can either go with a banana weight with bead chains like we have right here. Or if you don't wanna get stuck fishing the exact same size lead, you can go with the Dave's Tango Free or you can go with just your normal lead balls. But what I'm gonna do today, since I wanna be able to change my weights depending on where I'm gonna fish, I'm gonna go with the Dave's Tangle Free. The knot I'm gonna to use to connect my braided line just to make sure it doesn't slip is a little bit different. I'm gonna fold my line over on itself. I'm gonna run it through that three-way swivel that I have here with the little clevis. I'm gonna make three or four wraps with that looped end. You don't wanna to go too much. Four or five work pretty darn good, or else it gets really hard to do this part. I'm gonna do my normal fisherman's knot basically but pushing that loop back through. There we go. So you see you got that loop. Basically it gives you the ability to have two different strands of line holding onto that so you don't end up losing your expensive bobbers uh, and you pretty much can pull your weight off or break that leader line down below every time. Now for my leader, I'm not ever really gonna go under 15 pound test. So that's what I got here is 15 pound tough line fluorocarbon. I'm gonna go with about, I don't know, water's pretty dirty today. So I'm gonna start with about a three foot leader. Well here I'm using a three-aught mustad bait hook. 
Really, really good hook. This is a uh, thick wire, that way I'm not gonna bend out any of these big fish from fighting them in these rapids or this faster water. And now I'm gonna tie my bait loop. So I'm gonna go through my eye once. Let's take about a two inch tag end out of there. I'm gonna take my main line, I'm gonna wrap it around my hook about nine or 10 times. And I'm gonna hold it with my middle finger and my thumb. Stick the line back through, like so. Switch hands, grab that line and that main line again. Six more wraps, make sure to get it nice and wet, and then you can pull it through just like so. That's a perfect bait loop. Lift that up, my bait goes right underneath. After I hook it, we're ready to fish. Okay, here we go. I'm gonna do just a normal fisherman's knot to the bottom end of this. Leave that little tag in there. And last but not least, on a day like today, where we have pretty high water, we got a lot of boils out there, I'm gonna take just a small split shot and add it about six to eight inches, maybe 10 inches above where my bait's gonna be hanging down. And we're gonna attach our weight. So now it's time to talk about our bait. Now good eggs can be really hard to come by unless you're getting them yourself and you're curing them yourself. Ammerman eggs are good. There's some of the sunrise baits that can be really good. But the key is, is to find the best bait that you can. When you go to the store, open up the fridge and look through all the bait to make sure that you find the best options that you have there. What I have in here, I got some sand shrimp that have been sitting in my juice. We got our baits of eggs. I got a couple chunks of tuna. We got some nice baits cut there. And you can see I got a pile of goodies here. I got coon shrimp with me, I have tuna, I have my eggs, and then I have some sand shrimp. And that is, is pretty minimal actually for a lot of the people that go out and are really good at catching salmon. It's good to have a mixture of bait. Not all of it works every time. So having the combos of fishing eggs with sand shrimp, eggs with some sort of coon shrimp, or eggs with some sort of tuna, or the smorgasbord I call it, all of it together, can really help you be more effective at catching fish. Okay, here we go, bait up number one. I'm gonna go with about, I don't know, quarter size baits. It's best to start with smaller baits and then work your way bigger if you can tell it really is needed. What's the worst thing to do of all is blow through a lot of big globs of bait. And, and the thing is, I'd rather refresh my bait more often and use smaller pieces than use giant globs of eggs and leave them on there for long periods of time because I don't want to waste my eggs. I'd rather go through many small baits and have them be fresh and scenty than go through a lot of big baits and blow through a lot of good bait that I have. So for my first one, I'm gonna go some eggs. And the coon shrimp. I'm gonna hook that coon shrimp just through the thickest part of the tail. Pull it on up my line like that. Throw my bait loop around the whole shebang. Now let's fish it. Figuring out your depth is something you wanna do gradually. It's better to start shallow and work your way deep than it is to be too deep on the first cast, snag up, or waste a really good bait by getting it stuck on the bottom. When I'm fishing water that I know is deep, I like to go and like start at about five or six feet because the best case scenario is a fish that's sitting at 10 feet sees your bait, comes up and grabs it without you even having to adjust it to get down to him. But I'm gonna start this, this run at about six, seven feet. And then after my first couple casts, I'm gonna gradually go about a nine inches to a foot deeper after every single cast until I obviously am hitting the bottom. Okay, here we go. Okay, first cast, no fish. One thing I will say about fishing a, a hole like this, it's better to fish with your feet than it is your line. And what I mean by that is, it wastes a lot of bait reeling the bobber in and reeling your bait in against the current a long distance. But I'd rather fish my 45s. Fish 45 to about 45 degrees down river, about 100 feet down river from me, and then reel back in. If I wanna fish the very end of the tail out, it's better for me to walk down there, make that cast in, and fish that short window that I just did where I had originally started fishing the hole at the top. So after the first cast, we're gonna go a little bit deeper. And as you notice, my first cast was close, my second cast was out to the middle, and then my third cast was far. And I'm gonna keep doing that method as I'm working through a hole, because a lot of times, what I like to say is start fishing at the first place you can't see the bottom, which is only about 15 feet out here in front of me. So I can even start my cast that close and then slowly work it out further into the middle of the river. There's no need to cast to the far side on your very first cast and possibly miss all the fish that are in between you and that distance away.
Now that I've worked my way all the way across the river, I'm gonna throw that far cast and I'm gonna work that wall and then I'm gonna start all over again and, and start inside, go to the middle and go far. Start inside, go to the middle and go far. And then I'll work my way to the tail out, go back to the top. And if I know I'm in an area where there's fish, a lot of times the nice part about Chinook salmon is that they're very showy. They're gonna be jumping around. They're gonna be showing you that they're present in this area and in the hole. And that'll give you a good idea whether you need to move or that you should stay in that spot and keep fishing. Oh, what the f is that? Ooh, that was fishy. Pardon my language. That was a bobber up. So a really good indication and a way to tell if you're hitting bottom one is just the direction of your bobber and the way it's pointing. If it's pointing down river, odds are you are tapping bottom and it's dragging across the surface somewhere on the bottom of the river. If it's pointing straight up and down, it means you're within that good fishing realm. If it's pointing up river, it's a good bet that you're too shallow and the water currents are pulling your gear down river and forcing your bobber to point up river. So use that as your kind of, as your index. If your bobber's straight up and down, you're probably fishing well. If it's pointing up river, you're way too shallow. And if it's pointing down, you're obviously down there on the bottom and need to shallow up a little bit. Okay, now that I've tested my bobber and coon shrimp, it's time to go with a fresh bait of eggs. And a sand shrimp head. I personally like to cut my sand shrimp in half. You can run whole sand shrimp, but you go through them really quickly. So I use heads or tails. And this time, it's heads. Okay. All right. Didn't get them on the sand shrimp and eggs. Now it's time to, time to try the tuna and eggs. Nice little bait here. Ooh, that's some good eggs. Chunk of tuna. Through the skin first so it really stays on there. And then, for safe measure, I'm gonna add a little procure. Everything procure makes that is to be involved with salmon works incredibly good. So I would not leave home without it, whether you're using the Addicted Salmon Blend or the Anis Bloody Tuna or just the Bloody Tuna Oil. It all works really well and it adds an incredible amount of scent to your bait. Go ahead and add a little bit of that on there. A little bit goes a long way. Let that soak into my eggs. Last try. Ah. All right, everybody, nothing on the bobber today but we have plenty of footage. Here's some beat down action on how amazing this technique works. That'll avoid Jake. Yeah. Good job, dude. Heck yeah, everybody, we got one. We got him, we did it. Oh, it's right in the snout. Oh, oh, shit. <laughs> Nice one, nice one. Oh yeah. That's a fish. Yeah, here we go. Woo! Okay, second technique I'm gonna recommend everybody is probably the most entertaining and the most fun and one that's really started to catch on a lot in the Pacific Northwest, and that's the addicted twitching jig. Oh! There it is, a big box of jig. So you can see here how many different varieties and types that I have. The only one missing is the Nightmare, which ultimately is probably one of my favorite for this time of year. And you can tell how almost all of them are in the one ounce realm. I, even in shallower water this time of year, I like to use that bigger profile jig with that heavy head because we do have a lot of high flows. We have big boily currents and a lot of times you're gonna be fishing this deep style of water that we have here behind us. So to be quite honest, I wouldn't really go under a three quarter ounce jig this time of year or any time that you're gonna be fishing for Chinook salmon in any sort of salmon hole. So the rod I'm using here today is an Okuma X twitching rod. This is a seven and a half foot rod and it has a really strong backbone. 
slightly soft tip, but the thing is the very fast action rod, so you can catch up to that jig. You can make contact with it constantly by reeling very minimal. And that's so important because you wanna be able to feel your jig down there. One, so you're not snagging bottom, and two, so you can feel when that fish hits it on the fall. I have a 30 series Kaimar on here, and I have 30 pound test, 30 pound addicted enforcer braid. I like that enforcer braid because you can see exactly where your line's at, you don't lose it. And I tie a 20 pound bumper of fluorocarbon line, of tough line on the end of that, and then tie directly to my jig. Personally, I use a blood knot to tie on my bumper. There's three or four different kind of uni knots that you can use to a connect braided line to fluorocarbon or monofilament. And I always suggest use the one that you're best at tying. Do some research online, try a couple of knots, see which ones break easier, and then stick with the one that you're best at tying. But my favorite's the blood knot and it works good for me. With all that being said, let's hit the water and fish this. Okay, so one key thing when you're doing this is I like to start at the head of the run and I like to work down it. I feel like being methodical with how you fish fishing holes is the most important part of being successful. Unless you see fish rolling in a certain part of the hole or the fish are really telling you where you want to fish and you're just learning a spot, it's best to start at the top and slowly work your way down. When I start to fish these twitching jigs, one of the things I do not do is cast up river to let it sink. I always tend to cast it about 90 degrees across river, search for bottom like I'm about to show you, and then I fish my jig towards the bank as it swings below me. The reason is, is because in that case, you get more than one jig in front of a fish's face. If it just flies by their face really quickly, the fish sometimes don't have enough time to even react to it. But if you can get more than one or two or three jigs in front of a fish by swinging it at that angle and keeping it in front of the fish while you do your jigging motion, oftentimes by doing that, you will attract a lot more bites. Okay, so here it goes. I'm gonna hit the water, and one thing that I do particularly is I hold my line tight and I wait for that thing to hit the bottom. One of the easiest ways to be able to tell that you're getting close to bottom or that you've hit it is not by dumping a bunch of line out and waiting until you hopefully think that it's on the bottom. I wanna feel that contact and that is one of the reasons I use the one ounce jigs. So I'll show you that again. I throw it out there, I close my bail, I keep my line tight and I slowly lower my tip until I feel thump right there, I hit bottom. And now I'm gonna start my twitching motion. And my twitch here is very short and sweet. I'm barely moving that jig. I want it to go about a foot up and down and stay in that same strike zone and in that same area the whole time I'm fishing it. And then I'm gonna reel it straight back in. I'm not jigging it back towards me constantly and reeling that line in. I'm keeping it in the same strike zone down there in the bottom of the river and I'm moving it through and then I'm bringing it back. So as you can see, my jig is going from about my waistband up to my nose and not much more than that. You don't wanna be jigging over your head. You don't wanna be pulling too hard and you don't want that jig to go too far each time you jig it or else a lot of times the fish, again, won't have time to react. Keeping the line tight, line tight, and thump, there it is. The key is as soon as you feel that thump, close that bale as fast as possible and start bringing that jig back up off the bottom until you get it to that perfect mark and then you don't even have to reel. Now the thing about with the jig is I really don't use my close middle far method that often. I pretty much make the same distance cast every time, but I imperatively take two steps down river just about after every cast so I can work my jig down to where the fish might be or down to the fish that are already seeing my jig. A lot of times the fish won't go too far to chase the jig, but once it gets close enough to them, they get defensive and they want to hit it just because it's falling in front of their face. All right, everybody who fished it through, no luck today, but here's a little beat down scene of how good these jigs work. All right, now it's time for my all-time favorite, the spinners. So first off, rod selection for this. The rod can be so important for spinner fishing. One, because you need a sensitive rod. Two, you need something that has a good backbone because we are gonna be fighting big fish here. And three, you need something that casts well. What I have here is a Nokuma X-Rod 9.3. This is an eight to 17 pound rod. And it, this is the X-Rod series. And I have this in a bait caster. The spinning option of this rod works just as well, or if not even better than this. But personally, when I'm throwing the big spinners and I'm fishing for the bigger fish with the lighter tackle, I like to have a bait caster reel. 
if I'm gonna be using the spin setup on this, I'm gonna be using a C40 or a C30 reel. Why I'm gonna go with that 40 series reel a lot of the time is again, just in case I hook a big hot fish, he tries to take me down river, at least I have a little bit more extra line to fight that fish against the current and bring him back up to where I'm fishing. Just like on the twitching jig, I use a 30 pound braided line on here. And I think that is so extremely important because it cuts the water. Same thing with the twitching jig, but when we were fishing the twitching jigs in this video, we're using a one ounce jig. So no matter how heavy of line you're using, your jig's still gonna get to the bottom. With the spinner, if you're using too heavy of line and it's floating up on the surface, which this braided line is made to do, your spinner is not gonna get down in the strike zone, which is super important when you're fishing spinners. On the end of that braided line, I'm gonna add, be adding about six feet of fluorocarbon bumper, again, to tie my spinner onto, to avoid that high vis line being seen by the fish. Now it's time to go over the meat and potatoes. Here's a pretty well-rounded spinner box, I'd say. I have some bell body spinners, I have some bullet body spinners, I have an array of colors, and I even have some spoons in here. When I'm fishing for salmon, I like to stay in that size five range, especially if it's for a Chinook salmon in the spring. Anytime you go any smaller, especially if it's in a bell body spinner, you're gonna have a really hard time getting down and into the strike zone. So the couple of the ones I have in here, I have some steelhead slammer blades, I have some R&B blades, I have some blue fox blades as well, and I have, again, a, a huge assortment of colors. I feel like a lot of times, Chinook in particular, like chartreuse, pink, green, or blues, most of the time in any sort of water condition that you're looking at. The reason I'm gonna have different styles of spinners is for different kinds of water. So if I'm gonna be using a bell body spinner like the Blue Fox, I wanna be fishing anywhere from three to five feet of water, much shallower. Even though it's a size five, I'm not gonna trust that thing to get down and deep in current that's more than six, seven feet deep. If I'm fishing anything from about six to 12 feet deep, I'm gonna be using a bullet blade spinner or something that's gonna cut through the water a lot better and get down deep in front of those fish. And if I'm fishing any deeper than that, I'm gonna be using like a Northwest Extreme or like a big jetty bomb style of steelhead slammer so that I can let that thing sink all the way down to the bottom of the hole and then slowly reel it back in. One thing I don't often do is add a snap swivel when I'm tying these spinners onto my line. These R&B blades come with a little bit of a swivel on it already, so I'm gonna use that swivel right there just for safe measures. But honestly, one of the most important things of fishing a spinner in general is I almost religiously take off the treble hook that comes on most spinners. The thing I like to use most of all is a two-aught Mustad Siwash hook. And these things work so, so well on keeping those fish hooked. I've never seen a hook that actually gets the entire hook gap filled up with flesh and keeps that fish on as well as they do. So ultimately, if I have any biggest tip on this video, it's to change out every one of your spinners with these two-aught Mustad Siwash hooks. Time to fish. Okay, now that we're fishing, one thing that is so important here is the method behind fishing spinners. It's so crucial to not just whimsically cast out into the water. We're not trout fishing, we're not fishing for a little panfish or something, we are methodically fishing through this hole. So one thing I'm gonna really stress as a method is the close, middle, far, two-step method. You wanna fish through a run. The thing about a spinner is it's a good way to sweep through an entire hole and fish as much water as possible and not only be fishing one line and track like you do with a bobber and eggs or any of the other methods that we've shown you today. You can cast close, middle, far, two steps. Close, middle, far, two steps. And by doing so, you cover every little amount of water that is possible for those fish to swim up, like in a situation like this. So here we go. I'm gonna make my first cast right about to the middle of the river, right where I stopped seeing the bottom. It'll blow your mind sometimes how close you'll catch fish in close to the bank here. Now that that's done, I'm gonna reel it back in. I'm not gonna reel in slow because I don't ever try to reel my spinner back in slowly because once it gets parallel with the bank and you're bringing it back in, very, very seldom will you actually hook a salmon. Okay, the next cast, I'm gonna go about three quarters of the way across. Keep my tip down nice and low so that spinner works its way down to the bottom. And the key is, is to follow your spinner blade with your rod tip. If you keep your rod tip in one position and that spinner comes across, you have a lot less sensitivity and you can't tell one when you're hitting bottom or two when a fish grabs it. Third cast is all the way to the other side of the river. Pull that line tight. Again, tip down, pointed right at my spinner and swinging it straight across, almost barely reeling. This entire time I've probably reeled three cranks. I'm letting the current do all the work. And that's how you pick out a spinner hole. Something that has a fast current, something that has the same depth relatively all the way across the river, and it has structure for those fish to sit behind that you can target with each cast. Okay, now that I've made that three casts, I'm gonna take two big boy steps down river, and I'm gonna start my sequence over again. 
So key point of all, as you guys have seen here, is to keep moving as you're fishing a spinner. One thing somebody shouldn't do is stand in one spot more than 10 casts and not have the urge to start moving down river. The effectiveness behind fishing spinners for salmon is to find the fish that want to bite it, not wait for them. So keep that method of the close middle far two step, work your way down river and have fun catching fish on spinners. And now here's a little beat down scene of these things in action. All right, everybody, I hope you've enjoyed today's video and it gives you a little extra knowledge to go out and have fun salmon fishing here this year. If you guys wanna see more fun and informational tutorials just like you saw here today, go up here and click this link to this next video. Go down here, hit subscribe, turn those bells on, give this video a thumbs up, comment below, and you can be the comment of the day just like this person right here. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. You stay fishy, we'll see you out there.